the story that we're telling you today is kind of becoming a classic UFO story now that it's out there, but I don't think maybe many of you have heard it. Okay, so this took place in Ruwa, Zimbabwe, which is a country in the southern part of Africa. It took place at a private school called the Ariel School, and the city of Ruwa is an area of a lot of agricultural land, and the school was founded by local farmers in 1991. By 1994, between about 100 to 200 kids were enrolled in grades 1 through 7, aged 6 to 12. The kids' ethnicities were diverse, and most came from wealthy farming families. The day of September 16th, the weather was perfect, warm and clear skies, and at 10 a.m., the kids were let outside for their regular morning recess, and the teachers were all inside attending a staff meeting, which is weird because, like, why would you have just, like, no teachers on the playground? That's what I was thinking, too. Like, how did not a single teacher oversee, yeah. like, 100 kids out there? There was one lady, though, named Allison Kirkland. She was running what they call a tuck shop, which was just basically a snack stand, kind of like in the breezeway of the building by the playground. But like she wasn't in the playground watching them. Like her job was just to sell snacks. So the yard was virtually empty with minimal grass, no trees or bushes, and only a few play structures near the classrooms. The playground had a fence at the edge of the yard, and on the other side was a field covered in brush and short trees. But on this day, the kids were drawn further out into the playground by flashing lights that appeared in the sky. They ran to the fence to see and looked on in awe as a large silver craft hovered above the trees in the distance. Now, from what I've read, the craft was elliptical shape with a shiny surface, Eventually, the large craft landed and strange beings emerged from the craft with some kids saying they saw them materialize out of thin air. One or two of the beings stood on top of the large craft and looked at the kids in the yard and one began walking towards them. But the way it walked was described very strangely. It's been said that it would kind of like fade in and out in my mind, like fading in and out of dimensions almost, like a holograph, and disappearing and reappearing as it walked towards the pool at the school. <laughs> that rhymed. And also, <laughs> why is there a pool at the school? Anyways. <laughs> oh, so there's 100 unsupervised children and there's a pool involved. Yeah, sounds for Heard. like a recipe for disaster. America could never. No, hell no. <laughs> But also the way that they describe this walking reminds me of how Stephen Greer kind of explains how aliens appear to him on his little close encounter group meetings. Because, like, he'll have cameras and stuff, and you don't see it with your physical eyes, but, like, the camera will catch, like, an alien light source type of thing. Yeah. They said the one walking near them was like skipping in the air, going back and forth as it, as if it was glitching. The other two aliens on top of the craft watched their other alien friend assess the kids. When they all stared at the kids, all of the kids stared back and felt this big gust of wind as it happened. And then it was like they were given a telepathic message although not all of the kids claimed this they saw images of earth being destructed by environmental catastrophes one student saw heavily polluted oceans one saw an earth with no trees or air to breathe and one student got a message that we need to use technology more responsibly the incident lasted for about 15 minutes and the beings went back into the craft, and it faded from view. As soon as it was gone, the kids ran to Allison, screaming about a ship in the air and black beings with big black eyes. 
Allison thought they were just like playing a prank on her and refused to leave her snack stand. Which, if I was an adult in that situation, best believe I'd be like, what, UFO? Let me see. (laughs) So, as they went on with their school day, many of the kids were feeling unsettled, confused, and some were even crying. They were trying to tell the teachers, but of course, they were very skeptical, thinking that the kids made up this story. That night, when they talked to their parents... Many of the children were still unsettled in the comfort of their own home, and they asked questions that were then asked of the faculty. Some parents even brought the kids back to the schoolyard that day to search for any evidence, (laughs) me, but everything looked untouched. The parents didn't necessarily believe what the kids were saying, but they believed something weird did happen because why would all these kids lie and come up with this story? When school resumed on Monday, many parents demanded answers from the school. With this prompting, the headmaster of the school, Colin Mackey, separated all 62 witnesses and asked them to draw what they saw and write about what happened. This gave researchers and investigators great resources and became one of the most well-documented UFO experiences in history. All of their pictures and stories were remarkably similar. They came back with similar images of silvery, classic UFO-type crafts, sometimes complete with alien figures standing nearby. A BBC reporter named Tim visited the school and videoed their accounts, and their stories all remained consistent, and the kids were noticeably still shaken. Tim had reported on wars and a bunch of dark stuff, but this actually scared him. After Tim reported this story, many others did as well. Cynthia Hind or Hind, is a MUFON field investigator and editor of UFO Afri News. And she was the first UFOologist on the case. Gunther Hoffer, an electronics enthusiast and acquaintance of Hind, Hind, I don't know, I'll call her Cynthia on a first name basis he went along with her and swept the yard with a metal detector a magnetometer and there were no unusual finds of course why do i feel like that tells you nothing exactly (laughs) it does tell you nothing like what did they think they were going to gain from that like the aliens like left behind some metal or something they were going to (laughs) find well you know how sometimes they say that like Wherever UFO has been, there is some kind of, like, electric field going on there. Like, it does something. I've seen it somewhere. I nothing about aliens, so no, but, like, I believe that. It sounds like it makes sense. Oh, my gosh. We need to do more alien episodes, man. You need to get caught up. (laughs) (laughs) So, the team sent ground samples to the University of Zimbabwe, which, again, returned with no significant anomalies. Then, after reviewing the kids' drawings and first written accounts, Cynthia interviewed the witnesses' grades three and up, and she spoke with the school's teachers and administrators. What Cynthia found curious was that the students, who all had different backgrounds, they all described similar features of the figures and the UFO, despite interpreting the phenomenon in wildly different ways based on their own upbringing. Some thought the figures were (laughs) Zvikwambo, which are spirits of humans raised by magic, or Tokolishi, which is... Props to you for going for those words, because I would not have. (laughs) (laughs) You know I always try, and it's always horrible, but I try. I have my wins sometimes. But that word that I just said, that's evil goblin creatures of Shauna and Nedeble folklore. But you get the gist. Like, these students came from different backgrounds. They believed in different spiritual beings and so on and so forth. But even though they, like, interpreted it different, all of their sightings and explanations were still the same. 
So Cynthia believes these different interpretations, accompanied by similar drawings and descriptions, gave more credibility to the idea that the children had seen a UFO event. She also believed that the kids would not have had access to media about UFOs, which could have tainted their testimony or planted similar images in their imaginations, saying a lot of these children don't go to the movies. They live in the country and their parents are farmers. The argument being that if they had not encountered these images before and then described something similar, it gives more credibility to their alien encounter being real. But a problem with her idea that the children didn't know of typical depictions of aliens was that the country was in the middle of like a UFO fever, if you will, at the time. Two days previously, the Zenit 2 rocket from Cosmos 2290 satellite had re-entered the atmosphere, causing a fireball in the sky. It wasn't known what the object was by so some local residents, and ZBC radio had been hit with numerous calls claiming to have seen UFOs. Cynthia herself had learned about the incident after talking to the station herself after a call was made about the school. And then next in investigators came Dr. John E. Mack, a noted Harvard Medical School psychiatrist and UFOologist who was visiting Africa at the time to explore the abduction phenomenon there (laughs) and visited the aerial school. They had, like, a whole abduction problem going on over there? Apparently. I mean, this was a quote-unquote UFO fever. (laughs) He spent two days talking with the kids, accompanied by his assistant and South African TV camera operator who filmed some of the interviews. Through testimony collected by Mac, a new narrative emerged. When talking to the professor, this is when the children reported receiving those telepathic messages from the aliens. Despite being one of the reasons why the area school incident is so widely known, Mac's interview technique was sloppy. (laughs) He arrived months after the incident, meaning that the children could, like, consolidate their stories in their minds and, like, memories start to fade away, and it's likely he prompted the children, perhaps unconsciously, to recall these telepathic events. But that's just one critic's point of view. I think he did an okay job, but he should have got there faster. 